that there must be more questions from the students than there are answers that you get from me with some prepared lecture. Does that sound reasonable? Yeah. Maybe they don't have any questions. I got a question. <laughs> well, look, you know, we've been spending time, I don't know any other university that I know of that talks about the people that you played with, like James Black, and, you know, uh, the people on, from the, 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 that uh, contributed to the, uh, the music in the Silver Book or whatever. And we've been playing some of James's music. He played some last night. Can you talk a little bit about James Black, your experience, and just let them know who, you know, because I, you know, I knew him and played with him too, but it's, uh, <laughs> he's got this funny smile on his face when he talks about James Black, but uh, yeah. he's, uh, he's an important figure in New Orleans uh, jazz history for sure, you know. You know, in, in some ways, uh, my, re my recollections of Jan Black in retrospect, there's, there's a couple of James Blacks, really. One was more on the musical side, and the other was the personal side. Musically, James is probably the best musician that I had ever played with. When I say that, <clears throat> I have reference to his ability not only to play the drums, but to have an understanding of where the drums fit into a jazz ensemble and I remember one story somebody told me about James in a studio uh, recording with some group, I don't know who it was, and he had headphones on and for some reason either they weren't working or he was uncomfortable with that. So he just took the headphones off and the tempo never changed. And uh, that was one of the most unusual things because if, if everybody's got headphones on and then you, one takes it off, usually you get thrown off, but not James Black. <laughs> James played uh, trumpet and uh, Southern University concert band. And those of you who maybe not are not from here, Southern University is about 80 miles north of here. And uh, as you can tell from the Silver Book, he was a composer. And I just found out fairly recently from my son Jason that he is on a recording that I didn't know about called Live at Peps. Peps was a club in uh, Philly, I think it is. Philadelphia. We, and he was, at, at the time, he was with uh, Yusuf Latif. I haven't heard it, but I hear, you know, that is, you know, something that should be checked out. I'm, I'm going to have to get it eventually. Uh, James was uh, also. <coughs> the kind of person musically that all aspiring musicians, especially uh, those who want to play jazz music, should be, you should avail yourselves of piano skills. 
because all of the songs that you play in the silver book, he worked them out on, on the piano. There was only one tune which I don't think is in the silver book. It was a ballad that James wrote because at a certain point in time, I would tell him, I said, man, let's see, you have to spell out these cards. I said, these card symbols are not making it. Because, you know, you couldn't use card symbols specifically to get the voicing that he wanted. And to the best of my knowledge, he only wrote one song like that. Uh, trying to think, what was the name of that? Did you da da do di di da, di di da di da 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 ya? Da 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 da. Yeah, it's it's a, it's a wonderful song, and it's the only one that I never ever knew of him actually writing all the notes out, and not depending on chord symbols. Was it, was it a ballad? No. Yeah. Oh, that's a love song. Yeah. Yeah, love song. Yeah. Love song. Yeah. Yeah, that was it. Yeah. And he used a lot of slash chords. I actually, I wrote that one out. I got a tr uh, transcription into that one, you know. But, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's a beautiful song. Yeah. I think, uh, who was it? Donald Byrd, I think, might have recorded it with Tork. Because Torkinowski knew the song. And they played it, they played it on, on David Torkinowski's one on the record. <laughs> yeah. I hope so, <laughs> <laughs> because I, I've never, I never really, I never recorded that. Yeah. Of all of the tunes of James that I recorded, that was one that yeah, I never song. recorded. And I kind of, I may still do it, but all of the music that I had that he had written, even just arrangements and transcription, uh, I don't have any more. I moved too many times to too many different places. And the love song is one. But, uh, <clears throat> there's, there's not a, a whole lot that I can say about James that you couldn't glean from listening to his music or playing his music that he composed that's in the Silver Book. Well, I have a, I have a miss, maybe you can shed light on this, from when I'm talking about James, this is a mystery to me, because I didn't know him at the time when you were playing with him. I knew him later, but is it true that he was the one that kind of introduced odd time signature playing in New Orleans, like, you know, doing like Magnolia Triangle and songs like Dee Wee and things like that. I don't think stuff was being done before that. And my question is, is like, I know that, I know that Take Five, the Dave Brubeck song was very popular, right? It was like a million seller. seller. It, it, it probably ran that run time. Do you, do you feel like he was maybe saying, oh, this is the way we do it here or something? I don't know, I'm just speculating, but what, you know, was anybody doing odd time signature playing before James kind of started writing tunes? Not to my recollection. Yeah, me either. Well, there was a uh, Max Roach recorded a uh, piece in five. Yeah, but I'm talking about in New Orleans. Oh no, no, no. I mean, that was the, nobody was doing stuff like that in no. New Orleans before you all started doing. It. No, there wasn't anybody. In fact, I ran from a lot of them songs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he just kept, we was in system, like, like the Magnolia Triangle, which actually is one of the easier ones of mixed media that he composed. That was the first one that I was sort of coerced in the play. Mm -hmm. We were working at the Playboy Club then. Yeah, okay. All right. You know, with a trio. Yeah. Uh, but you think that was just something he just decided he wanted to do that, or you think he was reacting to what he was hearing, like other people do, and stuff like that, or anything like that? No, man, that's something like Cannonball would say. He did it because he could do it. Mm -hmm. You know, that was basically it. I mean, you know, like the thing 
uh, with Brubeck that was interesting to me is that there was, in reality, when you listen to it, what you get is a measure of three and a measure of two. Right. You don't really get five. Yeah, four. Dark, 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 dark. See, like the way James wrote the music, you got five. You see? And uh, he thought, he, I remember him, him say one time, he said, all music is in one. Hmm. Yeah, you he never did explain that, but the way he played, I, I sort of understood what he meant by that. Uh, James <coughs> might have been a great teacher. I never knew. There was one guy he was teaching, but I never didn't know him. He came and sat in at Lou and Charlie, and he played <laughs> Black James. Oh, really? Well, Jason but, studied with him. Didn't, huh? didn't Jason study with him a little bit? Uh, not much. He did because when Jason went to a lesson, I took Jason to a lesson maybe two, not long after that. Uh, just to divert just a little bit. Some people, not just in music probably, but some people are fortunate in ways that cannot be explained. Jason Marcellus is one of them. Mm -hmm. He had a lesson with uh, the guy in Boston who came here, who taught Tony Williams. Alan Dawson. Yeah, Alan Dawson. Alan Dawson, he was eight years old and Delphio took him, Delphio was at Berkeley at the time and took him for a lesson with Alan Dawson. Later, he had um, a lesson with Ed Blackwell when we were living in uh, Richmond, Virginia. He um, had lessons uh, like with us. Oh, no, not Hutch. Uh, he was playing with Betty Carter when they came through here. I forgot his name. <coughs> and, uh, and this was all during the time when he was very young. And <coughs> but to be exposed to the level of players that he was exposed to at that time in his life, I don't know what that is. I, I hate to say luck, because luck sounds too much like a casino. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, for the most part, I mean, you know, he was exposed to a lot, a lot of uh, drummers early on. But see, the thing about <clears throat> The thing about James also is that he understood all of the aspects of New Orleans type of music. Now, when I say New Orleans styles of music, what I mean is he was familiar with the uh, the second line concept could go in the studio and play funk music and some of the stuff that uh, McLaughlin and them were doing because he wrote that stuff out. Mm -hmm. You know. I remember we went to hear Coltrane when Coltrane was here and James made a comment, he was listening to Elvin, and he told me, he said, man, I see what this guy is doing. He said, I'm gonna refine that. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know whether or not, I, I wouldn't necessarily say that he did, or that he didn't, you know. But for the most part, and I've thought about it, 
James is, is really the best musician on that instrument that I've played with. And I, when I say that instrument, what I mean is that when you are part of a rhythm section, there are responsibilities that you have, which is not the same as playing in a horn section, you know, be it saxophone section, trombone, trumpet, whatever it is. Because the rhythm section ultimately defines the direction and the concept of where the song is going. You know, I remember when Jason would produce uh, that uh, uh, open letter, open invitation to Thelonious Monk. His comment was that he said, like, most, a lot of Monk's music is very adaptable to, like, funk beats. Mm. Now, I never heard that. Because I know now the reason why I didn't hear it is because it was baffling to me to just listen to Monk and try to figure out where Monk was going with his melodies and uh, the spaces that he used, you know. But uh, in fact, he, uh, he, it was kind of an example like that last night when we played Tail. Do you remember how he played that? That was like a funk beat. Mm -hmm. And, uh, <clears throat> but that is one of the things that can be, uh, people who play in rhythm sections have to, have to, uh, to adjust themselves to. And uh, I'm still learning even without being teaching now about what a, the rhythm section really is. See, the first problem that you run into with a rhythm section is that it's organic. You know, if you're playing in a section and then there's an arrangement, even if it's a big band or if it's a small band arrangement. The notes are written there. You play what's in front of you and you phrase in accordance to whatever, whoever the leader might be or whatever you're trying to get in terms of being in that section. But when it comes to the, the rhythm section, even if it's a big band. Whatever the rhythm section is playing is going to be the concept of what is being played, whether it's a big band, combo, or whatever. And the movement from one to the other, when I say the, uh, the movement inside the rhythm section, uh, when it comes to the basic rhythm section being piano, bass, and drums. Now, there's a piano, bass, drums, and guitar in the basic band. I remember uh, Freddie Green told me when they used to play for dances, because back in the days, uh, there were lots of Ballrooms, the Dreamland Ballroom, Savoy Ballroom, a lot of them in different places. And bands played for dances. They were all like dance bands. And Freddie Green said that when they would play for those dances, he would look out on the dance floor and lock into the best couple that was on the floor. And that became his whole rhythmic inspiration mm -hmm. in terms of tempo, phrasing, and everything else. Mm -hmm. And he was always, I don't know that he ever played electric. Mm -hmm. Not to mind, do you? It, I don't no, think I he think ever did. He, did he was always playing that acoustic guitar. Mm -hmm. So 
that rhythm section is unique. You know, especially with the acoustic guitar, piano, bass, and drums. But even if you have parts to read, and you're in a rhythm section, there's still that whole organic flow that has to take place, that kind of give and take. One thing that I found out from, uh, I don't remember if it was from a drummer or a trumpet player, one of the two. A new drummer came into the band and the lead trumpet player in the band had a conversation with the, the new drummer. He says, okay, listen, this is the first trumpet part. Check out this first trumpet part. He said, because if you don't get that, you can break the first trumpet player's chops by not really playing in accordance with what's on that sheet. Because I know there was a drummer from here went up to Hollywood, Earl Palmer. Now, Earl was a great musician also, but in most cases, if there was a big band and it was a arrangement, he would always look over the shoulder of the first trumpet player. Now, at the time he was doing that, I didn't know what he was doing. But I did find out later what he was talking about, because most of the hits, if you just listen to a recording, you know, listen to uh, Thad Jones, Mel Lewis band, you know, maybe the other Woody Harmon's band. Stan Kent's band was good, but it was more harmonic than it was anything else. You know, it was not about any element of swing. But for the most part, that was the, the responsibility of the rhythm section to define what is taking place in, in the music that's being played. Questions? It's a very small group, they don't have no questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was wondering what was the movement of creating the the Silver Book, and like if you plan, if you set out to create a volume of music by this, um, you know, by yourself and the other composers, James Black and Harold Baptiste, or if that was something that you, it kind of came together after the fact, or just what the, what the movement, yeah, what the Silver Book was hoping to enlighten people with. <laughs> After, when you say after the fact, you the book. oh, like did you set out to create something called the Silver Book, or later after there were many? No, well, it was really it was really no. Harold's oh, one. Okay. the inspiration just, behind no. creating the book itself. <laughs> oh, okay. See, the story of the Silver Book is interesting. When I was doing our growing up years in New Orleans, Harold Baptiste, Albert Baptiste. Uh, James really wasn't a part of that. He came later. Primarily it was Harold and Alvin. And we were playing in a group called American Jazz Quintet. I think there's a picture of us on the back of the silver book. And we were just trying to figure out how to play this music. And some of us, were more inclined to composing than others. Edward Blackwell never composed anything. And Edward was the first drummer that I played with that helped me to learn how to hear a drummer. So uh, none of the bass players that we had composed anything. So uh, I think Nat composed one piece. And in reference to what you were saying, in, what is it, 1988, I think, somewhere around that time, all of us 
whose <coughs> picture is on the back of the silver book were in different places. Harold Baptiste was in Los Angeles and had become the musical director for the Sonny and Cher TV show. Edward Blackwell was living in New York. I was on faculty in Richmond, Virginia. Alvin was a faculty at the Southern University in Baton Rouge. And we were asked to come together by a promoter named Rob Gibson. Rob Gibson did a series of festivals with different musicians. Uh, and he wanted to celebrate Edward Blackwell. So he called us, who were scattered here and there. So we went into Atlanta, which is where Gibson was based. And Alvin, <coughs> Alvin took the time and sort of just scratched out a few lead sheets. Because we hadn't played that music most of the music in, the, in there was music composed in the 1950s. Mm -hmm. This festival of celebration was in the 80s. So we hadn't played any of this, you know, in years. So when we were getting ready to rehearse, I was getting ready to sit at the piano, and there was a, about five of the songs that Alvin had scratched out. I mean, I say scratched out because it was a very hasty kind of thing. You know, we just were there for that. And uh, none of the rest of us did anything <laughs> to contribute to it. So while I was looking at that, I was getting ready to sit down at the piano and Harold was standing nearby and I mentioned to Harold, I said, man, I said, everything that I really know about music is in this, this stuff that we did. That was basically it. And Harold went back and started to put the silver book together based on that comment. Because he had music and then he knew a lot of it all in song. And that was how the, 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 the silver book came into existence. Mm -hmm. Now that's a, a very small claim because there's no energy in making a comment. Mm -hmm. But Harold said that later. Uh, he got an award somewhere and he mentioned that I had made a comment to him about the music, and then that's what gave him the idea of assimilating the silver book. But it was all a part of a growth process, you know. You figure out how to play some things, and then you know, write it out. And those of us who actually went to a music school did learn the technique of how to write uh, write out whatever we were doing. And that was basically the whole thing. Which I'm, I'm glad he did it. <laughs> and that, that book is still available, you know, it's a, you know, sometimes it's hard to find, but somebody told me they, they saw it on Amazon. It was, it said, how many people have the silver book? Yeah, and where did you, just out of curiosity, where did you get it from? How did you get it? Stole it from another musician. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> stole it from what? Huh? He said he stole it from another musician. <laughs> <laughs> I remember earlier this year there were about five or ten copies put into the Louisiana Music Factory. Yeah, yeah the Louisiana yeah. Music Factory usually has them, you know. But somebody somebody told me Amazon it was on Amazon. That was just surprising to me. But, you know. So they're still around out there. You know, it's a it's a very valuable book. You should get you should get that book if you can. Do you have 
any advice on practicing that you've given students or remind yourself of or given your children in terms of practicing music or their instruments? You mean the sheer act of practice? Yes. Uh, well, basically, what you have to do is, as far as practice is concerned, it all should be concentrating. Now, when I say concentrating, what I mean is in the early years of my youth, like a lot of people, I was always looking for shortcuts, like everybody. So I had an exercise book, and I figured, uh, I mean exercises that I was working on, so I figured, you know, this is a repetitious thing, you know, like at the time I think I was practicing Hannah. I said, I could get a book, man, and put it in front of me and read and practice Hannah, because I don't have to think about that. <laughs> don't ever believe that. <laughs> no. It has to be concentrated practice. Now, when I say that, this is what goes on. And I use the piano. But it doesn't have to be the piano. It can be any instrument. Like, if you are practicing scales, then you practice slowly so that the sound that emanates from the piano of, um, from each finger uh, pressing the keys is even. And you have to be able to hear that. Uh, and if you are at a point where you have to play chords, you have to make sure that all of the notes in the chords are sounding. Because I know sometimes, I think I was guilty of this too. If I was playing a chord, see this little finger on the right hand, the note didn't come out. And you would think that it came out because you already heard it. That's what you wanted to play. You know, one of A minor seven chords with the B natural on top, you want, you know that that's what it's supposed to sound like. So when you play it, you really think that it's coming out, and it may not be. Which is, again, talking about concentrated practice. You see, and I don't know that it's that much of a difference from one instrument to the next. Now, I did discover something about the drums and the snare drum. There were some drummers, they would loosen the head a little on the, on the drum set. And I remember I had observed that a couple of times, but it, it wasn't something that made a difference to me. But I, I think I understood why it was happening. So I was talking with James, James Black, and he said, man, I wonder why is it them cats play with them loose heads like that? I said, well, for one thing, when you loosen the head, the stick doesn't come back and reverberate as fast because the head is loose. If you tighten it, that stick is coming back at you. So that means that you're going to have to spend some time developing the technique that it takes to control that, you know? And, and that's one of the things that's peculiar to that, those instruments. Actually, I don't, I don't think that a set of drums is an instrument. I think it's a collection of instruments, you know? Well, uh, and you have to be able to coordinate and deal with bass drum, snare drum, floor time, mounted time, and that's even before you even get to talk about cymbals. I remember <clears throat> Ever Blackwell did not drive, 
So he called me up and said, man, come go with me because I need to go to Warline. Warline was the music store in the city of New Orleans. He said, I ought to buy, check out some symbols. So I said, yeah, okay, so we do that. And the guy would bring out a symbol and he'd put it on his finger and take the stick and hit it, turn it, hit it again, and spin it, hit it again. And when he got the symbol that he, he, that he wanted, he'd hit it. he said, yeah, man, you hear that? You hear that? I didn't hear nothing. <laughs> you know, I did You know, a lot of it was him bang, tang, tang, whatever he was doing. You see, the drummers I found later on, as far as symbols are concerned, is what they call a sweet spot. I've heard it referred to as a sweet spot. Now, I don't know what that means. You'd have to ask the drummer who uses that term. But when it comes down to it, there's a whole bunch of things involving like symbols that people who play that instrument, they know. And I don't. But they, again, you still have to have a concentrated effort in terms of practicing the stroke. Mm -hmm. Do you have any uh, suggestions on how to best young musicians to, to best uh, uh, develop their ear? And like, how did you? How did you? Like, when you were when you were in early in your career, how did you learn music? Because, you know, nowadays we have all this technology. We have, uh, <laughs> you take that. But, uh, I don't know how to stop this. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, you know, we have all this technology and ways to slow things at YouTube and all this kind of stuff. And I remember, correct me if I'm wrong, but I remember you telling me a story a long time ago that on a Sunday morning there was some kind of cartoon or something like that and there was a guitar chord that happened at the end of the cartoon and you like you would wait for it and you hear that chord and then the, the, the next time you could ever get a chance to figure it out was the next week. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, oh it man, now with all this technology we have. But I mean it wasn't it wasn't a cartoon and it wasn't on Sunday. Okay. It was a TV show called Mr. Lucky. Oh Mr. Lucky, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah Henry Mancini, right, right. Yeah, yeah, you know, okay. and each time they would go to commercial, the guitar player would just strum this chord. Okay. And I said, man, I like that. But the only time I could get it, you know, when the TV show came on. Yeah, it was when the show came no on. No video recording. I eventually just got one note at a time. <laughs> <laughs> you know, until I was able to play the whole chord. Yeah, yeah. But you know, I mean, you, but you know, for the most part, you learn from records, or you learn from listening to other people. I mean, talk about the importance of just developing and learning music by ear. Uh, I don't think there's any other way to learn music except by ear. No, the reason why I say that is not to condemn studying composition or studying your instrument with notated music. But when it comes down to it, if you are going to play, you have to play whatever the music that really speaks to you. Like, there's all kinds of music that's being played on radios and whatever, not all of it is going to speak to you. So consequently, unless the, the, uh, the, the particular music that happens to be available for you, because some people, they live in areas where certain music is just not available, you know, but you, that's the first thing you need to do. Now, studying music formally is a way to help identify what it is 
that you've been listening to and you enjoy. See, that's what happens when you study, go to classes, and you uh, have teachers who explain uh, the fundamentals of composition and all of, you know, that kind of thing. But all of this, about all of the music that you learn, you learn by ear. Because there's no other way for you to get it except to hear it. Now, whatever you learn, there's a point in time where you can begin to refine what you do. And by that, what I mean is, well, let's just take, if, if you were a piano player, and you started out, like I started out listening to like rhythm and blues, and all them, and all them shuffles and boogies and all of that. And eventually, I had some friends who was listening to some more challenging music. You know, like Bud Powell. So when I started listening to that, Bud Powell, you know, and Thelonious Monk, well, I didn't like Monk at all. I, I couldn't use that. So, and believe me, that was not Monk's fault. <laughs> you know? But the more you listen to it, <clears throat> if, you, if you accept the idea that listening has a challenge unto itself, then you don't dismiss something because the first time you hear it, you don't like it. It's understandable. I don't know, a friend of mine, I remember I was in Charles Lloyd's house and he was playing this recording of John Coltrane. And I listened to it, I said, man, I don't like him, man. I like Sonny Ross. <laughs> Which in, some, in a way is a very dumb statement to make. <laughs> you know, one doesn't have anything to do with the other. You see, and you have to listen and absorb when you can. Because it may take a while. Like it took a while for me to, to really get into Thelonious Monk. And not to, to the two oldest sons of mine about Thelonious Monk. <laughs> they won't hear nothing about Monk. <laughs> I don't even know if they remember that now. <laughs> See, but <clears throat> it's a conditioned process. Uh, Gunther Schuller told me that, you know, because Gunther Schuller conducted orchestras where there was a lot of atonal music. See, an atonality is not anything that's natural. Because when I asked him, he said, "Man, how do you, hit, you know, how do you know what's right, what's wrong? How do you conduct?" And he said, "Well, you have to teach yourself that." You know, between the score and the, and the performances and rehearsal, you learn about the atonality that is in the music that you conducted. Now, for some people, they never quite get the atonality, like me. I never quite got to it. But. Even so, atonality can be tonal music that's beyond the scope of your immediate understanding, wherever you happen to be in your development. It becomes atonal then, until eventually, you know, it says, oh, okay, I see here where this is. It. And in a lot of ways, it may be considered
primitive, whatever that means. Mm -hmm. Because there's a tendency for people who teach in uh, universities and music programs to think that whatever is not a part of that is primitive. You know, if it's not. But I think, for example, that which we call folk music makes a lot of difference. And I don't know how to cut this thing off. <laughs> <laughs> As you can see, I'm kind of technologically ignorant. <laughs> yeah, I think when it comes to folk music, I think that there's there can sometimes be a misunderstanding about folk music. Uh, <clears throat> in a way, all of the music that is learned by people, you know, from a very young age, based on what they hear, is folk music. Because, you know, there's some kids that can play bluegrass, you know, they ain't going to no conservatory to learn that. You know, you hear one of them playing Orange Blossom Special, you know, <laughs> believe me, <laughs> that's not that where that comes from. One of the people who I never met, who I think in summer programs dealing with, uh, Bluegrass fiddle player, Mark O'Connor. Uh, uh, he's a friend of my son. I, but like I said, I've never met him. But uh, I've heard him recording, I've heard him play. But like Mark O'Connor also has composed music for orchestra. So there has to be some influence in terms of the folk music and whatever he composed, you know. But you have to, like I said, the music has to speak to you. You know, I listen to Charlie Daniels, man. And I, I love that, man. Charlie Daniels is something else. And the more you listen to whatever's available for you to hear, that, it, that facilitates a level of growth in you. And you may be in a band, or you may just be with friends and listening to music and what have you, and eventually you start to hear some things that your friends ain't hearing. And it's okay. But that's a part of the growth cycle. That's what happened to James and a good friend of his, James Black. Because he was asking me about it. He said, man, Junie, he said, I don't know what's happening in here, man. I'm like, yeah. I said, hey, you know, you are now leaving them behind. And that's just the way things are. Does does some of that stuff kind of speak to developing your own voice and sound, like um, trying to make more things available to your ear and learning by ear and discovering things that speak to you and uh, learning how to incorporate those influences into what you play? Does, does like some of that have to do with developing your own voice on whatever musical instrument you're using? Does some of Some of what? the things you were talking about, like, like using your ear to learn and uh, and like trying to develop your ear to make different kinds of music available to you. Um, like does some of that speak to like developing your own voice and the way you play? 
it it does did that affect how you learn whatever it is that you learn. But it can be very difficult if you set out with the purpose of saying to yourself, well, I am going to develop my ear. Now, how are you going to do that? What is it that you're going to listen to that's going to help you develop your ear? You know? Because uh, there's no one particular way in which that occurs. Because the more you listen, you know, I had an English teacher that once told us, there is no good reading, there is only good rereading. And it was a long time before I understood that. And when it comes to it, you can't listen at something one time and reject it out of hand or listen to it maybe two times, three times and formulate an opinion and say, well, that's okay. If it's challenging to you, you know, if it really challenges you, you should look at listening more and more and more. That's the way Jason is. Right? Well, he's got perfect pitch, right? Too, right? He does, but I don't think that matters, man. I really don't. Because when I was teaching that number, there were five students in the class I had, and they all had perfect pitch. Which, I don't think it means anything. I really don't. Uh, because even though they had, uh, I remember I had students from the jazz class and students from classes in the same class. And one of the first things that I discovered, because I was teaching a course called Sightseeing and Air Trend, which we dealt five days a week. Like most institutions, Sight singing is an appendage to theory, which is really not correct. It shouldn't be that. But anyway, in this class that I was teaching, I remember that I played a triad, you know, the little CEG kind of triad. And all the kids that was in the jazz class, they had no problem hearing that. But the classical kids had a difficult time. And I couldn't understand why. Because they had great pitch, hearing, you know, pitch memory. But what I understood eventually, because I had to develop exercises to help them to practice to hear chords, even though I didn't go beyond the triad in that particular class. Um, is that they learn how to hear horizontally. You know, in a lot of exams in those sight singing, air training classes, the piano, the teacher punches out notes on the piano singularly, or else they'll do an uh, interval, you know, and how you hear that, you see, but once I, what I did, I had to write out exercises that was in triads, in root position, first, uh, yeah, first inversion, second inversion, and then also, um, what is it, what is it, a suspension. So that you take a B and an F and a G, and then you move the B up to C, you know, and the F remains, and then you resolve it. So, and I had to write all of that out and give it to them so they could actually practice that. Because they did, they had trouble with hearing chords. Now, we're not even talking about chords that the jazz kids was using, you know, in major sevens and nines and thirteens, none of that. But just 
the, the, the basis of the triad. Because once, once you get the triad down that you, where you can hear that, uh, you, you can add the other notes in a chord, you know, with not a lot of difficulty. What, what about swing? Huh? How, do you, how do you teach someone that doesn't have a conception of how to swing, how do they develop that? To swing, like, you know, to play, play in time or just, you know, I mean, someone that doesn't have good time, how should they work on that? Or what, what would you suggest on that? Work on time? On time and the sense of swing. Swing? You know, yeah, how do, you, how do you get a student that's not swinging to swing? <laughs> Sounds like an easy that's question. Not a, that's not a problem that I actually ended up solving in the, in the course of the teaching. But I have theories about that. Because see, here's the thing about the element of swing. You know, what I mentioned to you that Freddie Green told me. You see, swing in music is related to dance. It's in, really, it's inseparable. And when it comes down to it, if you go back, if you listen to, like, I, I use Freddie Green mostly as an example because of how he played what he played, which was not any kind of harmonic sophistication. You know, it was a ching, 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 ching. But you have to listen to that, you know, and hear how it fits within the rhythm section and the whole band. Because that came out of dance. And there was a period of time when two guys in particular, Charles Parker and John Burks Gillespie, well, they kind of screwed all that up. Now, they both came out of blues bands and dance bands. But once they started dealing with what was subsequently called bebop, the music became about, how fast can you play this? How long can you solo? You know, the whole thing. It just went by the wayside. Now, both of them and all of the surrogates, so to speak, understood and could play and swing. But they were playing a, a different e evolved aspect of music. So when it came down to it, the experience of the dance was left out. See, now I got it mainly to playing at places like the do Rock where you had to just play them shuffles all the time. And it was based on dancing. And I'm not sure how to introduce that. <laughs> to be honest with you, I don't know. Uh, I understand that today there's this thing they call swing dance that people are more and more getting into swing dance, but I don't know if that's the same thing that relates to it. Uh, but I've, I've never really had an occasion to have to deal with that. We had, uh, a, you, know, you know who Carlos Malta is? He's a, he's a woodwind player from Brazil. Play with Hermeto Pascual or whatever. And one of the things he taught the students to do, like when they practice scales, is they should they should walk as they you know walk in a certain pattern or whatever, and, and play the scales as they almost like dancing in a way, you know. So they're they're, is they're he practicing. From television program, a Spanish program. I forget the call letter, and I didn't understand. The language, but it was a sh a sh this particular show. Telemundo, Telemundo. That that I think that's the network Telemundo. Okay. Uh, I don't remember the name of the show itself, but there was a mariachi band that was on the stage, and periodically they would play. 
And when they would play, people in the audience would just get up and start dancing. <laughs> you know, which was indigenous to the culture. And uh, basically, if you if it's somebody for which that is indigenous to their culture, it's probably difficult to explain how do you do that to somebody who's outside of that culture. <coughs> you know, uh, I was trying to explain to a drummer about the second line and how you, how you do that. I was not successful. The drummer at Bramper's group, on the other hand, he came from Philly, Philadelphia. And he came down here, the first thing he wanted to do was meet up with Harold and Riley and, uh, Shannon, you know, what's his name? Shannon Powell. Shannon Powell. <laughs> and somehow, he hooked it up, because Bramper told me later on. He said he heard him playing, he said, all right, man, don't know my hometown stuff over there. Mm. You know, it's, it is, it's something that can be learned. It's, I don't think that it's, it's, uh, it can be learned, but there has to be a, a way to recreate, I don't even know if that's the right word, to indoctrinate the person to the culture, even if it's artificially. You know, like I got a bunch of CDs that I collected by Louis Jordan. Now Louis Jordan was a, totally, that was his thing, shuffles. And the songs he would sing, and like he played alto, but you know, wasn't nothing screaming about his alto playing. But if you listen to that, uh, and there again, I, you know, it's not something that I can say that I had success with with any students. But it's something that I can suggest, you know, that you get that, and not, I say Louis Jordan, primarily I say Louis Jordan, because there was a consistency in his rhythm section, because he was a good musician. You know, he did, uh, he played with Fletcher Henderson's band, and you couldn't even get in that band unless you were a top rated musician. Of course, it only lasted for six months, which is probably why. But uh, <clears throat> I think that that's something that has to be there. You find recordings of people in which that element is prevalent. Now, it can be difficult to grasp the aspects of swing listening to Elvin Jones. It's there. Mm -hmm. But, you know, Elvin has taken it to another level. See, with Louis Jordan, basic. So, you know, when it comes to the element of swing, you're gonna have to figure a way to indoctrinate the, the students by way of recorded music. Or, or get them to start dancing. Uh, <laughs> get them to start dancing. <laughs> that, I don't think that would help unless they were inclined to that. <laughs> and I'm telling you, really, man, because, I, you know, I play with a tennis saxophone player named Nathaniel Perala. And Nathaniel could swing. Mm -hmm. Man, that couldn't dance, man, if you were shooting at him. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because I, you know, when I was in elementary school, the teachers that I had were very conscious of social interaction with male and female. And at this time, they used to have the old 78 players, you know, and on periodic on certain days, they would bring recordings in, and they would play the recordings, and they would make guys who weren't inclined to dance, yours truly being one of them, 
you know, then you will be peeling them off the wall. Get over there. Get that girl over there. Go dance. You know, and man, I had two left feet. You know, so I know it's not being able to dance. Because I've seen a couple of instances where, you know, some good players, but I don't know they can't dance. Yeah, oh, no. <laughs> But I do, I, I think, without actually having done it, I do think that there's a way to indoctrinate students towards listening mm -hmm. to the music that has that ingredient in it. You know. Mm -hmm. Mr. Marcellus, what, what changes or developments do you wish you could see more in today's schools or in today's jazz scene? What stage? What, what changes or what developments do you, do you wish you could see happening more in today's schools and in today's jazz scene? When you think about your experience, <clears throat> what you've been through in school as a student and a teacher and as a performer, and then you look at what's happening in today's schools and in today's jazz scene, what are some new directions you'd like to see happening? Well, if I had my way, I'd shut all of the school down. <laughs> Start from scratch. <laughs> but I, know, I know that's not going to work. <laughs> no, I know, I know exactly what you're talking about. But see, when you start talking about the schools today, See, the, the thing about schools today, schools today has a lot more promise than it has commitment. Um, every now and then, I would tune in to that Cox Channel, which has all the people from the public schools, you know, talking heads. And there was a consistency with all of the people in the the education arena stem consistent. And the E in STEM does not stand for English. So I've never quite been able to figure out how you get students to learn science, technology, engineering, and math, and they can't read. Now that's a, a, a little bit away from what you were addressing with that, but for the most part, the, the school systems, uh, there's, there's a group of music merchandisers, because they had a convention in New Orleans. This was a lot of small businesses, but their business was selling music, sheet music, instruments, and what have you. And one of the guys who was in the organization said, yeah, man, we're trying to push the whole idea of STEAM instead of just STEM. And the A stands for arts. So then you get science, technology, engineering, arts, and math. Now, I don't know how, how much success he's had, but I have not ex and, and, and there's another thing, I don't know a lot about the schools today. I got three grandchildren in elementary school. And all three of them are studying piano. What that means, I don't know. It might not mean anything. Uh, it probably means something, but nothing that's measurable, so to speak. But I don't really know anything about the schools of today from a philosophical standpoint of view. From a political standpoint of view, we could argue all day. You know, because it's not that hard to find out uh, which ones, which senator or representative voted for what. And in most cases, it's showing sure no music. So, um, Let's have uh, one more question because we, you know, we've been very generous with his time, and you know, but we have to kind of bring things to a close. 
How about another question for? Uh, um, when playing in like a combo setting as a pianist, uh, do you find that your uh, your focus is more on playing within the rhythm section or accompanying the solos? Uh, I'm certain it's some mix. Right? Okay, well let me make sure I heard that. Find playing with a with a solo with a vocalist. Yeah, like uh, like accompanying a sax player or something. It, is the role of the, the pianist more to? Are you more focused on locking in with the rhythm section, or more focused on trying to help push the solos uh, who, who's playing at the time? Well, you, I don't think that you you help the soloist in that sense. You know, uh, what you have to learn and understand about being in a rhythm section is that that section is an organic give and take kind of thing. So if you are accompanying the soloist, your cues come from what they play. Basically that's it. So you have to be as familiar as you can be with the harmony that you can, it's almost like, like a harmonic dictionary. You have to be uh, acquainted enough with that to be able to play chords and voice them in such a way that it's su supportive of the solo. But the solo is, is sort of out there. You know, they, they, they're looking to, to be supported in a way that that goes with whatever it is that they plan. And that's a whole other thing. We could spend a lot of time talking about accompaniment. I don't know that they even teach that in classical music. But most times, people who become accompanists in classical music usually do so because they didn't succeed on a concerto trail. <laughs> and unless they happen to land a job in which the studio produces other people who can play like they play, then if they are sensitive enough to be able to accompany, especially operatic singers who are sort of on the waning years of their career, because what they'll do, they may not be featured in operas, like they used to when they were younger, but they can uh, take advantage of going on the road and singing the arias from operas like Aida, La Boheme. You know, they, they have arias which you can sing, and you need accompanists for that. But I don't know that they put any emphasis on accompaniment, even in that. So it's something that you have to figure out. I know it was something I had to figure out. When's, when's the next time you're playing in, in, the, in the city? Snug Harbor? Where's, where's your next gig in, in the city that they can come hear you play? At Tulane tonight. Oh, Tulane, okay. At Lanyap. Oh, okay. Snug Harbor. At, at, a, at a lesser school. Everybody's going to work, you know. Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> Tomorrow night is at Snug. Okay. Snug Harbor. Great. How about a hand for the great Ellis?